days of Jesus Take me back to the writing on the wall Take me back to the days of Moses Let me see the water open right up Son, Craig, you simply amaze me. Anyway, good morning, or good noon time. Um, today I want to talk about the Philistines and how they captured the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, I'd like to start out with a prayer. So, Father God, we come before your throne of grace once again, Lord. We thank you for your awesome love, Lord, and how it touches our hearts. And the reason we love you so much, Lord, is because you put that love in us and you chose us. And Lord, we pray for those that don't know you, Lord, and, and that you would give them an opportunity to get to know you, Lord. Then maybe even a messenger can make an effect on somebody. So just bless them, Lord, as the Holy Spirit speaks through me, Lord, and May the message be uh, a good thing for people to hear. Uh, I pray that in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to start out. Um, this title is called The Philistines Captured the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm going to read 1 Samuel 4, 1 through 18. So bear with the reading. The Philistine captured the ark. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. 
the Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer and the Philistines were Aphek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp and the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. So they sent to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven's armies who was enthroned between the cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the Ark of the Covenant of Phinehas of God. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud it made the ground shake. What's going on? The Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the Ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slaves, just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. Their survivors turned and fled to their tents. The Ark of the Covenant, God, the Ark of God or the Ark of the Covenant, whichever, was captured. And Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's two unruly sons, were killed. Do you remember the vow God made in our last teaching? He, he made a vow that he was going to execute them. So in verse 12, it starts off by going, A man from the tribe of Benjamin ran from the battlefield and arrived at Shiloh later that same day. He had torn his clothes and put dust on his head to show his grief. Eli was waiting beside the road to hear the news of the battle, for his heart trembled for the safety of the Ark of God. When the messenger arrived and told what had happened, an outcry resounded throughout the town. What is all the noise about, Eli asked. The messenger rushed over to Eli, who was 98 years old and blind. In fact, he said to Eli, I have just come from the battlefield. I was there this very day. What happened, my son, Eli demanded. Israel has, has been defeated by the Philistines. The messenger replied, the people have been slaughtered and your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were also killed and the Ark of God had been captured. When the messenger mentioned what had happened to the Ark of the God, Eli fell backward from his seat beside the gate he broke his neck and died, for he was an old and overweight man. He had been Israel's judge for 40 years. So, again, the vow from God was that he was going to execute Eli and his two children, Phineas and Hophni. And so it happened. God makes a vow, he sticks to it. So, um, let's just go through this a little bit. So, I would like to review a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant and the fact that it was uh, approximately four feet by two feet by two feet, give or take a couple inches. And in the Ark, there were a number of things, three. There was the stone tablets of that Moses got when God told them what, the Ten Commandments to put on the stones. So that was in the ark. And then there was Aaron's budded staff that actually produced almonds, a fruit. And then there was the gold jar of manna. And I 
believe that was to remind us of their walk through Egypt and how they needed food and how God provided them manna when they needed it. So throughout this time, the Philistines had been Israel's major enemy. Iron chariots they had. They organized their infantry and Israel was absolutely no match for them. The tabernacle was in Shiloh, where it actually should have stayed. And the ark was kept in the Holy of Holies, which I talked about last week. And the famous Hophni and Phineas brothers desecrated the sanctuary by going into it unlawfully, and they took out the Ark of Covenant, which is a major mistake. So, the Israelites recognized the great holiness of the Ark. But here we see that they thought it was powerful and used it as a good luck charm. Just because we have a symbol of God does not mean we have his power. You know, I think of my cross. My cross has no power in it. But it makes me proud to wear it because I'm proud to be a Christian. And also, a lot of people, not a lot, but you know, 10 or 12 people have asked me about the cross and it's given me an opportunity to share about the Lord with them. So again, I'm proud to wear the cross and the only time it's off me is when my two grandchildren pull it off me. So, back to the ark. The ark was close to being an idol at that point. So I'm going to read Samuel 4. 1 Samuel 4, 19-22. So now we're talking, this is Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near her time of delivery. When she heard that the Ark of God, or the Ark of the Covenant, had been captured, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth. She actually died in childbirth, but before she passed away, the midwives tried to encourage her. Don't be afraid, they said. You have a baby boy. But she did not answer or pay attention to them. She named the child Ichabod, which means, where is the glory? For she said, Israel's glory is gone. Now glory to me is excellence on display. And that's usually what the glory of God is. God's excellence on display. So, she named him this because the ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and husband were dead. Then she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. So, the Israelites thought the glory of God was gone. That God had deserted them. God uses his power when it's appropriate, according to his wisdom and his will and his way. You know, that's another thing. We got to be careful about God's will. We need, if we need things, we need to know what God's will is. How do we find the will of God? We read the Bible. And in the Bible, it talks all about the will of God. And if you pray according to his will in that Bible, he will answer that prayer. And things that I pray for that he's answered is things like knowledge or wisdom or understanding, uh, that I would walk in his ways. You know, those are the kind of prayers that you know he's going to answer. So keep that in mind that reading the word kind of gives you a, a little information about what his will is. And let's see. He responds to the faith of those who believe in him. His power was not in the ark. God is the source of life itself. They took the ark out looking for victory. But God left because of their disobedience. Disobedience. We shouldn't be disobedient to the word of God or to God. What, was, what happened because of disobedience? They lost 34,000 men. 
They lost the Ark of the Covenant in Shiloh. Remember God's vows we talked about? Eli's sons would die on the same day as well as in Hophni and Phinehas did die. And everybody thought the Ark was powerful in that it would save them, including the Philistines. Shouts of joy by the Israelites. The ground was shaken. Philistine, Philistines panicked. They were afraid. The Philistines didn't have the God of Israel. They thought it was the gods of Israel. They had no clue of who God was. They thought there were a bunch of gods that were taking care of Israel. But it was the one and only God. The one and only God. They remember stories about Egypt and what the gods of Israel did. Again, they didn't know what was going on when it came to God. When sin dominates our lives, even God's given joys seem empty. Phineas's wife lost joy even in having a child who she named Ichabod, which meant the glory had departed from Israel. The, Philistine, the Philistines though thought they were power, there was power in the ark, and they panicked. They fought as they had never fought before, and they killed 30,000 Israelites and captured the ark. Because of the Israelites' lack of obedience, the Philistines captured the ark and defeated them. They lost 34,000 men, as has been said before. Obedience to God is so important. We need to follow his ways. I know for myself, I actually did a, a 180 flip, my wife calls it. I, I went from a so-so a Christian to a fanatical Christian. And that would be being a fan of God. I'm okay with that. I don't mind being a fanatical Christian. Since... My faith and trust and hope and love is in God through Jesus. We can love God or we can reject him. His word is total truth. And the truth will set you free, the Bible says. I recognized I was a sinner. Jesus took my sin on himself. And it should have been me on the cross. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus suffered so much more than any of us have ever suffered. He was spit on, he was beaten, he was nailed to the cross. And he only said seven phrases in a matter of six hours of suffering. That's, a, that's absolutely amazing. He was a lamb led to slaughter, and he didn't make a peep. When I think of the love of God that I found in the Word, in our pastor's sermons, as well as the truth of the Word, when I go through a difficult time, I can always rely on that truth and feel the joy of the Lord and the peace of the Lord, even through difficult times. I understand what Paul said when he said, I have learned to be content in all things. And that's where I'm at now. I'm learning. I'm learning to be content in all the situations that I'm going through. And, and some are difficult. But I, again, I'm learning to be content and have joy and peace in the Lord. The bottom line is the truth will set you free and give you eternal life. The Bible is total truth. One day I will be in heaven. The reason I am part of this church for 20 years is that the pulpit, it always speaks the truth. As far as I've been there, I have heard nothing but the truth from our pastors. And 
That is why I'm still there today and will be there until I die. I praise God for our pastors, and we should all be praying for them, because many times they're under a spiritual attack. So, well, I just want to read one more thing to you, and that's John 3, 36. And anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. And I wouldn't want that for anyone. I would not want to be under his judgment. So I pray that none of you will suffer the wrath of God. I pray that you will come to understand and know who he is. That you would take the Bible and read, even if you have to read a little bit at a time. And those that don't know the Lord at all, just pick up the Bible and get a clue. Read, the, read John 3. Um, but this is... It's so important. The life we live on earth is terminal. It's not going to last a long time. But we all have an opportunity for eternal life. To be with God in heaven, feeling experience, the joy, and the fact that we will have every care wiped away. There will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more sicknesses. You know, we have a great opportunity especially people that don't know the Lord. If you hear what I'm saying, take hold of what I'm saying and give Jesus a chance. At least give the Bible a chance, then maybe you'll know who Jesus is. If you really want to know who Jesus is, read the four Gospels. That'll get you a clue of who Jesus is. And then you'll know who God is, because the only way to know God is through the Son. And the Son is Jesus and the four Gospels talk all about Jesus because he does the talking in those Gospels in not many of the words. So I pray that you have a great day. I pray that everything goes well for you. I pray that you come to know the Lord if you don't know him already. And Greg and I, we love you. And we'll see you next week. Lord willing, have a great day.